Father, we come to you this morning asking that where that is not true in our heart, in our mind, and in our lives, that we would begin the process to laying that at your feet. To be able to say, let go, my soul. The waves and winds still know his name. And whether that's physical waves and wind, or if that's spiritual, physical, emotional, Father, we give that to you. It is well. And Father, we pray especially for the families in El Paso this morning. Lord, the pain and hurt that they're going through, as well as in other places where disaster has happened. Lord, I pray that the body of Christ would reach out, and that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Our children are pre-K through third grade are headed out to Children's Church. Uh, parents, they don't have to go, but that is certainly an option for you if you'd like for them to. We have uh, adults who love and take care of our kids, and we are so grateful for them. As they're headed out, I do, just briefly, I don't do this very often, but do want to mention uh, some friends that we have here, the Tongue Gates. Uh, they come here yearly at least, if not a couple times a year. I'm glad they are here. And then for those of you who don't realize that I actually did go to high school, and I actually have a high school friend who is here, my uh, very good friend, Brad Birdsong. Uh, Brad, we don't talk about high school. Okay, so let, let's just leave that there. All right, but uh, Brad is here. <laughs> yeah, he'll talk about high school. That's what I'm afraid of. Okay. Well. I'm glad, uh, glad everyone is here. Glad you're here with us and be a part of this. Uh, we are in the third part of our series, uh, Money's Worth. Uh, just in case you've missed uh, a couple weeks, the first week of the series on Money's Worth, uh, we looked at Jesus' words and had a realignment uh, because the world gives us so many messages and we even had a montage of songs of what, what the world tells us about money. And, of course, you look at commercials and, you know, you got uh, whether it's a buy this or invest here. The world gives us mixed messages about money and finances. So we had a realignment. Then last week we looked at the true story in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira and looked at what our hearts look like when we are misaligned. And what we realize is that money is a lens or a microscope really into our heart that exposes other things. Money is a symptom that exposes the cancer of our sin in many instances. And in Ananias and, Ananias and Sapphira, what we saw was an extreme greed and desire for attention because of money. Today, we're going to look at something quite different uh, for the next three topics. I said at the beginning, this could be a four-week series or a six-week series. Right now, it's five and maybe six, so we'll see. But uh, for the next three weeks, we're going to look at some Bs. Today, we're going to look at be content. First Timothy chapter 6, 1 through 10, and then we'll pick it up in 17 through 19. I'm not preaching through the book of First Timothy yet. Uh, that might be down the road, but before we get to chapter 6, I want to make sure that you have an understanding, a background on what Paul is actually saying and what's going on here in 1 Timothy. The origins as well as the purpose of the book to add some context to what we're going to read. This letter was written to Timothy in AD 64 or 65, right around that time, after Paul's first imprisonment in Rome, and we see that in Acts chapter 28. Apparently, Paul had been out of prison for several years, and during that time, he had revisited many churches in Asia and Macedonia. When he and Timothy returned to Ephesus, he had been there before, had a church planted in Ephesus. He revisited, and when he and Timothy went back to Ephesus, they found widespread false teaching. 
It's amazing how many times false teaching is addressed in the New Testament. That's why it's so important for us to hold on to the gospel to make sure that we don't say something, that we don't apply something, that we don't add something to what Jesus said. And so Paul is fighting against some of that false teaching and the false teachers uh, that were found in Ephesus. Paul had warned the Ephesian elders to be on guard against the false teaching teachers who inevitably would come after he had left. And he says that in Acts chapter 20, 17 and following. Paul sent Timothy to lead the Ephesian church while he moved on to Macedonia. From there, Paul wrote this letter of encouragement and instruction to help Timothy deal with the difficult situation in the Ephesian church. And so Practically, what you could say is the book of Ephesians is the first letter to the Ephesians. Then 1 Timothy would be the second one. 2 Timothy would be the third one. All of this is to, to give instruction and application to this church. This is the background which we're going to read. We are reading the end of 1 Timothy, which means Paul has already addressed the theology. Any of Paul's epistles, anything that Paul writes, he gives a very brief acknowledgement. Hi, it's me, Paul. Uh, thank you to all those who helped me. And then he dives right into theology, addressing whatever he's needing to address with each church. And then the second half of each letter is a practical application of a life lived for Jesus. If you were here at the first of the year in our series, Life Lived New, in other words, that practical application was really how to love one another. So Paul's moved on to the practical teaching, and he is now telling Timothy what practical living uh, should look like for this Ephesian church. So let's get into it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I want to read just the first two verses as we get going here. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. Now, start here, laying the background, so that you know where we're going with this. For those of you who were here in the one chapter series, we addressed this topic I'm about to address. We addressed it with the book of Philemon. And Paul talks about the issue of bond servants or slaves and masters and the, the relationship between them. We address this with the book of Philemon who had a slave named Onesimus. Slavery in the Roman and Jewish legal system was not a racial superiority issue, but a financial issue. It was a debt repayment program. So they didn't have debt consolidation. They didn't have debt repayment programs. What they did, they would usually voluntarily say, I owe you this much. Or the, the person who had the debt, who, who was owed the debt, would say, okay, we need to work this out. You can help me out here. You can work for me for this length of time and pay off the debt. It was not a racial superiority issue. In case you were not here for Philemon, racial superiority has no place in the gathering or church of Jesus. For anyone to use a passage in the New Testament in support of racial superiority is a false teacher and it has no place in the body of believers. Racism is not to be a part of Jesus' people. And in light of what happened yesterday in El Paso, which seems to be a racial issue for what we see right now, it is a call to the body of Christ at large to reach out to love. The church at large and as much as possible in each individual church should be as diverse as God allows it. I realize that in Port A, there's only so much that, that can happen in our small little community here. But we need to press into, not avoid. We need to press into diversity. Because heaven is going to look a lot different than just what we see out here. 
What we gather from these two verses is a respect toward those who have authority and responsibility over us. We are so obsessed in our society today with individual rights that we have lost the concept of respect. And I'm not talking about outside these walls. I'm talking about within the body of believers in general. We've lost the concept of respect toward one another. And Paul is encouraging whether your, your master, whether the one that you are paying off the debt to is a believer, especially if they're a believer, show respect to them. But even if they're not, let them see Christ in you. Now verses 3 through 5. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness in, in your mind or in your Bible, whether it's digital or physical, you can highlight or underline that word godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining the godliness, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Paul reiterates this point from the previous uh, chapter, especially one and two. Uh, that false teachers have come into the church at Ephesus in order to stir up the body with false teaching about Jesus. And they do so by dividing the church into factions and they'll use these, these fancy words, try to create division. Hey, you believe this, right? What They don't believe that. Can you believe? And so they stir up and divide the body of Christ. They come across as wise and godly, but their fruits do not align with the life that looks like Jesus. The whole purpose in doing this with these false teachers is to bring focus on themselves and to bring financial gain to themselves, not for the gospel being used and spread to others. Now, what I want you to do is go back to 4 and 5, and I don't think I have it on the screen, but look at Paul's description of these false teachers. Look how their lives are filled with chaos and turmoil, which is the exact opposite of where Paul is heading. Paul says, these false teachers, they're puffed up with conceit. They don't understand anything. They have an unhealthy craving for controversy. Have you ever known someone who is constantly stirring the pot all the time? It's almost like they do it in their sleep. Don't you ever rest? An unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are deprived, de depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Imagine that godliness is a means of gain. So here's the point that Paul is telling us. When you see people that are constantly stirring the pot, especially if they're teachers of the Word of God, you need to avoid that. That's not someone you want to follow. Paul is saying that false teachers, that the false teacher's version of godliness, let me say that again. Paul is saying that the false teacher's version of godliness isn't godliness at all, but there's something so much better. So we get to our theme verse, verse 6 here. But godliness with contentment is gain. So, okay, I thought that was done. Now, verse 6. Earlier, can you mute uh, uh, every mic except for mine if it's not already? Just to be safe. All right, let's try it again. Hmm? Am I on? Yeah, okay. All right, we're good. But godliness, earlier I said, highlight that word at the end of verse 3. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So let's talk about this. What is godliness? Paul is using this term, godliness, in other words, someone who is wanting to become more like Jesus. It is growing to be more like Christ. 
It is not piety. It is not a puffed upness. It's not someone, oh, look at me. I'm so much better than you. That's not godliness. This idea of godliness is following Jesus, becoming more like him as much as we can on a daily basis. Paul is, the gain Paul is referring to is not a financial gain, but a gain that is so much greater and longer lasting. So Paul is focusing on that, that you may get a financial gain, but that's going to be temporary. That's going to be gone. There's a much greater gain that lasts for eternity. Verses 6 through 10, let's finish this up here, this set of verses. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. That sounds so much different than our society today, doesn't it? Got to have this, got to have that. Not only do I have to have this, but it has to have this name brand from this store, has to have this price tag. It's so much different than what we're being discipled by the world. We're being taught things by the world. We have to refocus, reorient our minds to Jesus. Verse 7 again, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. I have done many funerals, many memorial services as a pastor. I have never seen a hearse that is built to take something into eternity. It doesn't exist. What you store up in this life, you're not taking with you. But those who desire to be rich, uh, go verse 8. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Okay, so let's talk about this here. We have all heard of horror stories of people who have fallen into a great amount of wealth, whether it be inherited, uh, long-term, or they won the lottery, or some other means. They found themselves gaining some money, and it turns against them. They end up ruining aspects of their lives and relationships. Paul gives us some guidelines on how to live a Jesus-focused life, not a money Focused life. I'm going to give you six things here. This is not my normal uh, means of teaching. I'm very short and concise with my main point, but Paul here is very blunt about how to handle this. So I think we need to gain from it. There's six things that Paul brings out. I don't have them up on the screen, so you'll have to type them in your phone or write them down or something like that. First of all, out of verse 7 and verse 17, later on in chapter 6, realize that one day riches will be gone. Money is not eternity. It's not eternal. So realize that one day riches will be gone. Second thing, be content with what you have. Verse 8, be content with what you have. But I want a better, but I want that, but, but, okay, as we said last week, when there's a but, it's never good. Be content with what you have. Third thing Paul mentions, monitor what you're willing to do to get more money. In other words, what rules are you willing to break? What ethical standards are you willing to set aside? Monitor what you're willing to do to get more money, verses 9 and 10. The fourth thing, love people more than than money. He says that in verse 11. We haven't read that yet. But love people more than money. The fifth thing, love God's work more than money. Once again in verse 11. Is your desire to see the gospel spread or is your desire to see your bank account grow? 
I'm not saying it's wrong to have wealth. We'll get to that. I've talked about that throughout the series. But what's more important? Lastly, the sixth thing, freely share what you have with others. And that's where we're going in verse 18. Paul's whole point to Timothy and the believers in Ephesus is that gaining money at all costs, especially the false teachers who are taking advantage of the believers in Ephesus, is an empty well. One might hope to find riches, but it doesn't lead to contentment. This is the same for those who search for wealth in any number of ways. And the result is the same. Now listen carefully. Real Jesus-based contentment does not come from the pursuit of wealth, finances, or the possession of money. Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of contentment. Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of contentment. Paul, in Ephesians 4, 28, brings this out. He says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You're not going to be content getting money through dishonest gains. And even if your purpose is to gain money by honest gains, but that's your focus that you're not going to be content. What about those who have been given wealth and possessions? I heard you asking that. I'm so glad you asked that. Thank you. You're reading my notes. Verses 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, to be prideful, to be arrogant. Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Their, our hope is to be on God. Our hope is to be on Jesus, not on the uncertainty of money, wealth, finances, bank accounts, stock market, gold and silver. Shall we go on? who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. In other words, you're grateful for what God has given you. Verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what Take hold of that which is truly life. Notice Paul says they are to be ready to share. Paul doesn't say once you come to Christ and you have all this money, you have to give it away immediately. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But there's also some teachers who say that the possession of wealth is a bad thing. And that's not what Jesus said. That's not what Paul says. So the heart is to be one that is ready to share. They're looking for opportunities. God, do you want me to give away something that you've already given me? I'm ready. Show me where. Show me who. Ephesus was a city that had many wealthy people in it. It was famous for that. And some of them became Jesus followers. Paul tells them, to live their lives focused on Jesus, not on money. Verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Now, I've emphasized this point each of the three weeks that we've been in this series. I want to say it again. Having money through honest, ethical means is not a sin. That is a blessing. If you are someone that sees a resource that sees a plot of land, that sees an investment opportunity, and you invest and God allows you to make that increase, and you're able to make a profit off of that in an ethical way, praise the Lord, that is a gift from God that you're able to do that. But understand that it is God who gave you that gift. You didn't do that yourself. God gave you that opportunity. 
Paul emphasizes that it is the love of money that causes pain. God blesses people with many things, with abilities to work with our hands, with the ability to use our mind and, and to, to rate great, great works, people who have artistic ability, to have musical ability. God blesses us with many things. Sometimes it is financial gain. Is money your focus or is Jesus your focus? We can look around in our society today and we see very few people who are honestly content. Contentment is not an adjective that describes the American society. What I'd like for you to do is take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, if you're a Jesus follower, ask the Holy Spirit to take an inventory of your heart and your life. Is Jesus-based contentment anywhere to be found in your life? For many of you, you'd say, yeah, I, I am, but there might be just this one little thing 95% based on Jesus, but oh, there's this 5% over here that I've been holding on to. I, I want this thing. I want to pursue this. I want to get this opportunity. And you haven't given it to God. You haven't said, God, you know my heart's desire, but I'm laying it at your feet. Is this what you want me to have? And if not, I'll be content without it. Here's the bottom line. Money used as a tool for God. Here, here's what we've been doing in this series. We've been talking about money as an idol or money as a tool. Last week we saw what money as an idol can do to us. Money as a tool for God allows me to receive real Jesus-based contentment. Money as a tool for God allows me to receive real Jesus-based based contentment. So how do we use money as a tool? We, we outlined six of those things earlier that Paul talks about in this chapter. You can go back through and read this whole chapter later. But the issue is what's my focus? It's not wrong to have money, to have ability to make money. That is a gift from God. It is what is the focus of the heart, what is the focus of the mind. So the question is, what would be different in my life if it was focused on Jesus, not money? What would be different about your calendar, about your bank account, about the thoughts that consume your mind? This is what makes Jesus' people stand out in our society. Real Jesus-focused contentment, not based on money and possessions, is so different than the world. And non-believers will take notice. They'll think we're strange at first. Why aren't you pursuing what everyone else is pursuing? Why aren't you going after the American dream? Not that there's anything wrong, but is that where our heart is? Is that what Jesus wants for us? They might think we're strange, but if they keep looking, eventually they'll see Jesus. That's what we want them to see. Let me ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. Just for a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper here in just a few minutes. Before we get to that, I want to encourage you to do some soul searching. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak and to take some inventory of your heart and mind. What is the focus of your life? Maybe it's not money, but maybe it's not Jesus either. Maybe it's something completely different. And so you still may not have Jesus-based contentment, maybe pursuing other things. you don't have a relationship with Jesus. One thing that we focus around here is it's not about who gives what and the bank account, what we want to encourage you in. 
is pursuing a life that is based on Jesus. And for that to begin, it starts with the relationship with Jesus. If you're interested, I'd love to talk to you more about that, how to begin that relationship. For the rest of us in here, even as we're coming up taking the elements of the Lord's Supper, I'd like for you to continue this conversation with God about, Father, what, what am I pursuing in my life? Am I pursuing you or something that is a false and empty well. Let's stand together.